Hey, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk. I'm here with Tony Grayson, you know him. Uh, and we are here in Denver in front of a quantum solution. We're excited to get to talk to you, Tony, about what you built here. No, thank you, and thanks for coming. You know, why don't, Tony, before we start, how did you get to building something like this? Yeah, so very different path to tech. Uh, 21 years in the U.S. Navy. My lifelong goal was to command my own submarine. So I did that, but of those four years, I actually spent about 80% of my time at sea. So I really wanted to spend more time with my family. So I spent, you know, as soon as I left the Navy, I went to work for Facebook and then went to AWS to move up to, back up to Seattle. And then most recently, I ran all the physical infrastructure at Oracle. But about, you know, two years ago, we had a thing called dedicated regions. And dedicated regions were basically, we bring, bring Oracle Cloud to you. Because sure. you have all these people that want, you know, they want to go hug their servers. You have GDPR, Gaia X, all these kind of concerns over security, privacy, and you have latency concerns. So the biggest problem that we had really was we couldn't fit the number of racks needed for an Oracle Cloud right. in our enterprise data center. So I really wanted to do an Oracle in the box, if you will. Um, but it, you know, Oracle didn't want to go to that time, but I really saw the value in doing something like that. And luckily enough, Compass has two companies. They have Radix, uh, company, which is DCA and BMS, and they had at that point called Edgepoint. Uh, and so Chris uh, asked me to come on over and run that Edgepoint company. Quickly changed the name because I didn't want the word Edge at all in it, because Edge connotates something. <laughs> sure. And in reality, these are built to go anywhere. Yeah. The Arctic, the desert, metro, you know, it doesn't matter where you stick it. Um, so I think that's really the future, is they're going to have this distributed architecture of racks or network nodes everywhere. And, you know, in a world where like in our industry, feel like everyone is focused on larger, you know, hyperscale, and that's really what you've heard about the most. Yeah. You know, this is focusing on a totally different concept. But tell us just, for those that don't know, tell yeah. us about just that concept in general and how something like this would come to be. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, if you go talk to any site selection person and say, find me 200 acres and X, Y, or Z, they're built for that. Mm -hmm. Now go to that same person and say, find me a thousand sites across the United States with these requirements, and they're not set up for that. Sure. And then you have companies that, you know, they're really built around the hardware, the network or whatever, and they're, they're not in the data center space. So what we're just trying to do is make it super easy. All I need is a Latin along, and we provide an as a service offering. So on or on an operating lease or an MRR, we, uh, we manufacture the unit, we deploy the unit, we run the unit for you in terms of as a, as a service. So you can put whatever you want on the inside, you know, HPC, standard compute, networking, totally irrelevant to me. My whole thing is just to give you the best solution anywhere where you sure. want it. So it could be on a roof. We can actually stack these vertically. You can put it in the desert, you can put it in the Arctic without any real fundamental changes to the design. So it's a place this anywhere concept. Um, and you, you, we were talking earlier, this is the fourth generation. Fourth generation. So tell us, you know, what has changed? Yeah, uh, so the, the first three previous generations, generations. Uh, were really based around precast concrete. Um, great design. My problem is 64 tons it weighed, so super okay. expensive to transport. Sure. The actual crane is about 300 grand per day. It arrives in nine semis to actually sure. install it. And once you install it, it's pretty much stuck there. You can't really move it. And so I really wanted to come in and really build around you know, f five specific concepts. Um, the first one was sustainability. Okay. Concrete, not sustainable. So I started looking into the automotive industry or you know, hurricane proof homes and figuring out how they're trying to do it. And so we came up with using a composite with a major supplier. Um, and what I like about the composite is actually compared to a steel module, we actually save 90 tons of carbon. Interesting. Yeah. And the thing is 100% recyclable. So we yeah. actually suck up the dust during the manufacturing, yeah. reuse it and you can, when you're done with it, grind the whole thing up and reuse it as well. So that case for the sustainability, I wanted something strong. Okay. Good thing with the composite, we actually could handle a 250, uh, 250 mile per hour wind load. We can handle plus 75 to minus 85 differential pressure. So we can handle an F5 tornado. Mm -hmm. Commits in a Cat 5 hurricane, it's built around, you know, kind of the concept of hurricane proof homes. Sure. Um, we can actually, we start with nine millimeter, ballistic radium can actually go up to 308. We can handle like a missile impact of a nine, nine pound ball at 90 feet per second. Like all this stuff, it makes it super indestructible. It only weighs nine tons now, so from 64 tons to nine tons, which allows me to build it anywhere. 
but now it's sustainable. So we, you know, ideally want to say, you lease a unit, here's a scope three, and through my software, I can give you your scope one and two. So that covers sustainability and strength. The third one I really wanted to do was kind of, I wanted to have, you know, kind of different SKUs, and so we wanted like an HPC version, a standard okay, version, sure. and build around the idea of mass customization. Yep. Like, you don't see a car being hand-built. I mean, you do, but they're like Bugattis, and they're sure. millions and millions of dollars. There's a reason why the automotive industry builds in certain yeah. stages. So we wanted to copy basically the automotive industry, use a production line. Mm -hmm. uh, as we move through the station, that means we can maintain the quality. The same people do everything at the same time. The managers come to them, you get uh, QA comes to them, you get yeah. more output. Um, so we want to follow that kind of production line to do it. And then we wanted this mass idea of mass customization. I mean, there's a reason why Dell doesn't let you choose a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm, sure. you, you can choose, you can't choose the case, you can't choose the motherboard, you can choose everything else. Yep. But that allows them to simplify their supply chain, allows them to actually bring cheaper costs to you, and allows them to actually raise the quality. So for an ours, there are things you can change and things you can't change. So if you don't want to go with our mechanical electrical, we're not going to do it with you because sure. that's, I'm buying them in bulk for yeah. cheap prices and I'm, and that's what our design is built around. So we're really trying to actually build this in a way that I can actually crank out one of these in weeks yeah, sure. versus months because I don't have to change that much yep. to it. And so that was kind of this production, you know, modeling after the, the car industry. And the last thing, or the, the fourth thing I wanted to do was, you know, time to market matters. Yeah. And so I, I basically looked at how we're installing telephone, or actually light poles in cities and, and ski lifts, and they're using a thing called Pierce. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I use that technology for us. And what that allows me to do is I can actually install one of these in four hours. The piers are built for the density of sand, so as long as we're denser than sand, I don't have to geotech survey. Sure. I don't land grade, which also goes against the sustainability yeah. side. Um, and so the only real permitting I really have to do is electrical permitting. Yeah. Um, and I can actually deploy these in floodplains on top of roofs. And so we use these piers to install it, which also makes it super easy to take up when a customer leaves. And so if a customer doesn't want the unit anymore and they as a service, we will pick up the unit, take it away, refurbish it for another customer, but we'll pull out the piers and it's like we're never there. So you save timing with the way that you've figured out how to, to bring these to the market. Yep. You essentially can remove it if yep. someone yep. leaves. Yep. And then the, the, because we built it to move it, we can actually just stick this on a truck. So imagine a mobile data center yeah. that follows around private 5G for FEMA, FirstNet, DOD, and now you never actually have to have a stick built building yeah. because you could just have a mobile data center wherever you go. And the benefit of that is we fall under like RV rules. So as long as we have to, we move the thing every six months or six inches, sure. I never have to permit it at all. So it's just a, a mobile data center. And if somebody wants to add a different, another unit or something, like that, what's that process yeah, like? Yeah, so it's built, these are built to go side by side right next to each other, and they're built to grow vertically. So okay. whatever the customer wants, we can just, you know, they can, what, I, what I'd love to do is, you know, kind of you order servers like Amazon. I order, I need 12 new racks. I'll just order, in a, you know, a white, you know, one of these modules yeah. to kind of show up at the same time. So it's, we're trying to make it so you don't necessarily build the pad and everything. You just yeah. order it as you need it as a just-in-time kind of delivery service. Yeah. And then the last thing I wanted to do was I wanted software to control the whole thing. So this is why it's great to have a software company sure. as a sister company. So we actually have, it's called uh, Quantum View for the 80s fans. <laughs> Uh, you'll kind of know what I'm talking about, but we can actually track all the temperatures okay. on here based on trends, based on alarm set points. That can be sent out via ticket, SMS, email. Um, we have security, so if you walk by one of the security cameras, we get an alert on our knock. We can read, you know, license plates. We have some, you know, facial recognition software that's out there too if you want it. Um, we can do biometrics or anything like that. On the in inside, um, you know, we have about 45 gram worth of sensors. I'm not saying you have to need all that, but we have everything from like thermal imaging cameras, seismic and light. Not that I need seismic because the piers are seismic already rated, so I don't have to do the extra stuff. That's mainly, mainly for people breaking in. Temperatures, weather stations. We can actually control the mechanical units remotely, and we have the capability to actually shut breakers remotely with a, an energy management system upgrade. So it, it really gives us how do you manage a thousand units with minimum amount of people? It's really through software. You can't do the traditional problem. I'm just going to throw people at it, sure. which is a lot of the, what data centers yeah, tend to sure. do is, is solve it with people. Yeah, and I think you know by solving that part with the software, it you know makes a lot of sense, especially when these might be in one city and another city here, et cetera. So exactly. That's, that's exciting. Exactly. Um, so tell it. Let's talk about some use cases yeah. for this because I think you know one of the biggest challenges with 
the distribution of kind of this you know edge strategy that we've seen out there has just been the you know is there somebody that would need 20 of these 50 of these, 100 yeah. of these, but talk about where you're seeing some of the conversations go. Yeah, and so they kind of fall within a couple bins. The first one is this hub hub spoke. Okay. So the sure. first hub is a, you know, a flex central, neutrality, okay. a megaport, Equinix, like an entry point onto the internet or a peering point with the cloud okay. services. That has to be extended out to an aggregation point that's closer to a metro rural area. Okay. That's anywhere between 100 kilowatts to five megawatts. And a lot of this is being funded by, in the US by the BEAD, which is bringing rural broadband to okay. local sure. communities, yes. which is 44.25 billion. Yeah. So then <laughs> once bit. you have this aggregation point, they can actually spoke out into that okay. rural area. Got so it. think IOT, smart cities, smart yes. roads that front hall to this first aggregation point, which does local compute, yep. sends it back out if it needs to, or back hauls to okay. this peering point. So that's kind of the first use okay. case. Um, the second use case we're seeing is, it's fixed wireless telecom, so they, they can't put dense racks in these concrete huts they have out mm -hmm. there. They can't you know do standard compute, let alone HPC. And so they believe that you know fixed wireless is the future, meaning 5G private networks, yes. 5G and beyond that fiber is just too expensive to install. And so you have a lot of these telecoms that are looking, how do I do an aggregation point for four or five towers okay. and do that global around? Sure. And, and they're so, looking for partners. So like that. a mature uh, solution, this would potentially offer something like that. Exactly. Yeah. And since we can do HPC, we can give them AI, ML, and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the second use case. Um, the third use case is basically if you have fiber, you have power, and you have land, a lot of people are trying to monetize it right sure. now. And so it's, you know, think of these big electrical co-ops or think of all these fiber providers because they can sell at a fraction of a cost of a retail site, but still give it the same kind of consistency or latency that customers expect. Um, the fourth one we're seeing is really, it's I'm, the best way to say it's the death of the AV closet, sure. is if you have an office building yeah. and or anywhere and you have racks, yeah. most likely, you have too many racks to fit in there. Most likely they're shutting down during the day because of overheating. It's just AV versus IT. So this is a so, company that that their their IT infrastructure is almost they've just it's almost outgrown the ex exactly, facility. Exactly, exactly. And they don't and they might not want to go to the cloud or yeah. they might be coming back from the sure. cloud. And so it's on prem, near prem. Just let me know when you want it. I'll stick it in your parking lot, I'll stick okay. it in your roof, or I'll find some place close to you okay. through our partners yeah. and we'll, you know, take care of your racks and almost your enterprise data center yeah. and we'll enable you to kind of come back. And this is really, it's around the, you know, latency sensitive application, enterprise applications, a lot of privacy, FinServe, you name it. And so I pretty much can sell to anyone. Yeah. If you really have a rack, I can sell to you. Yeah. And let's talk density and kind of the future. Like yeah. what's maybe the density approach today? And then yeah. where do you think it could be in some of you know, like on Ours right now, our base solution is really 2N, 12 positions, 100 kilowatts. Okay. And so that we figure two racks are going to be patch panels, networky, kind of low density. So you're really at 10 kilowatts, 10, yeah. 10 and which is standard compute is not doing that. Standard computes right now at four to six, yeah. or maybe even six to eight. Yeah. We also have the capability for an HPC SKU using read or heat exchangers to go to a much higher density. Okay. So think 20, 30, 40 kilowatts per rack position yeah. to enable these HPC nodes that are starting to pop up right now. And, yeah. and what people are starting to do is start these companies where they basically going to sell C CPU hours just like a cloud, mm -hmm. but it's going to be local and at cheaper pricing for HPC. Um, you also seen it like a lot of AIML come to hospitals. You know, how do I? You know, it's an MRI that you get that yeah. compares against a database that shoots at radiologists a solution based on actual, no kidding, diagnosis and prognosis and outcomes. Um, we're starting to see a more of those AI kind of applications yeah. being pushed out to, I hate to say it's edge because it could be sure. in, a, in a metro area in a hospital. Yeah. So it's, you know, those are kind of the, what, you know, who we're dealing with right now. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting just the flexibility that this provides to a number of different types of users. Uh, I think in our space today, companies need that more than ever, you know, and, and it might be the, you mentioned the, the, the financial firm that their IT closet's gotten too big. It might be the telco that or, is growing. I mean, or, it, it's, but it's a really interesting, flexible solution. Yeah, I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're doing the racks, if you're making a bare metal service or virtualized compute service or an SD-WAN, that's where the money's at. Mm -hmm. Then, but you don't want to be a data center provider yeah. too. And so our whole thing is I will take care of the MEP portion. You take care of the fancy stuff that people sure. are buying. and you know, will enable your to be deployed successfully. I'm just trying to remove all the barriers that anyone has with racks to deploy them anywhere. Yeah, so just kind of last word, if you wanted anyone to know, you know, one thing about this solution, what would it be? I guess the one thing is, you know, we are trying to provide a, 
a low cost operational service that's sustainable, so we'll help you meet all your sustainability goals. That's strong, that can handle an F5 tornado, that can kind of go anywhere. Stop trying to solve it yourself, just come to us. We'll enable you to be successful and you can put your name on the side. Like, I would love to have you white label this and you put sure. whatever name we want on the side. We just want to be the silent partners in the background. Uh, making sure you're successful. Well, Tony, thank you very much for letting us be here in Denver. It is very fun to see the, the product itself. Uh, you've toured like 150 something people through 152 here. 152 people. Yeah, so we're 153. We're honored, but thank you for letting us see no, this. No, thanks for coming. I'm glad I got a chance to show it to you.